When we think of environmental pollution, we often think of the visible things, such as litter and dumping. But we typically don't consider the invisible things that can have serious effects on our health. Today we're going to look at some of the most strange and sinister things we've ever seen on EcoEye. The World Health Organization estimates that environmental hazards are responsible for at least a quarter of all the world's disease and premature deaths. These are usually caused by air and water quality or insufficient sanitation. Here in Ireland we dump thousands of chemicals into our water systems every year and millions of tonnes of pollution into the air that we breathe. Heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, Household chemicals, nanoparticles and pharmaceuticals are all dispersed into our natural environment. We've permanently altered our landscape to suit industry and easy transport. But what has all of this done to affect something much more important, our health? Because the effects of these pollutants are so complex, we're only beginning to understand the damage we're exposed to by some of these hazards. In this episode, I'm going to explore how our environment impacts on our health. And we're going to start here on the crystal clear waters of Loch Ennell. In past decades, Loch Ennell in County Westmead was a complete environmental disaster. But with massive investments in the wastewater treatment plant for Mullingar, there's now a resurgence of angling and safe swimming in the lake for the first time in a long time. So what are the benefits now for the local community here? Every community needs clean water for bathing, for drinking, for uh, recreation, even you know, for food production. Uh, from our perspective, uh, a thriving clean fishery has economic benefits in terms of anglers coming to the locality to fish. Angling tourism to Ireland is worth about 750 million. My God, 750 million? Yes. Wow. There's no doubt the improvements on the lake were a big success for public health and the economy. But a few years back, Dermot helped specialist toxicologist Dr Andy Fogarty discover something very strange about the lake's fish. So why did you pick this lake now for your study that you're doing on fish? Well, first and foremost, I'm a very passionate angler. Studies had been published back in the 90s uh, about uh, intersex in fish. Intersex? Can you explain that? Yeah. Intersex is the simultaneous presence of both male and female germ cells in the same fish. So you're looking at male fish with eggs. Male fish should not have eggs. You're looking at male fish having an a enzyme called vitality that's a female protein. It should not be in it. Andy explained that with the help of Inland Fisheries Ireland, he took samples of fish downstream of the wastewater treatment plant and a control sample upstream. Back at his lab in Athlone IT, Andy discovered that the fish he had sampled had been dramatically affected by the chemicals in the water coming down from the plant. So when we looked at Mullingar, the Brosna, we actually found downstream of the sewage treatment plant, we actually had fish. Now in this case, it actually was roach. They actually had eggs in their testes. The male fish basically had uh, female eggs in them. That should not happen. Andy explained that the new wastewater treatment plant system may have improved the problem here. But all across the country are wastewater plants are not designed to remove these chemicals. They typically discharge straight back into the natural water system. We also have huge amounts of these chemicals coming from septic tanks and agricultural veterinary sources, all going straight into our natural water systems. Andy also discovered that trout were found to have delayed sperm production, all because the endocrine system of the fish was being affected by chemicals in the water. And where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from a consequence of modern living. They're coming from pesticides, they're coming from the human birth control pill, they're coming from um, plasticizers that make plastic flexible, they are coming from pharmaceuticals. So they are actually coming from modern living. 
does it affect us? Unfortunately, humans are incredibly complicated, okay? If we look at, let's say, a decreased puberty, age of puberty, the average age of, of a girl entering puberty in the 19th century was 14 years. In the 1950s, it was 12 and a half years of age. Now, in Western societies, girls, the average age of onset of puberty is 10 and a half years. And what about boys? Boys, yeah. A very controversial study was published 20 years ago that said that the male sperm count, it was a Danish study that the male sperm count had halved in the last 50 years. Now, are we saying that's directly got to do with endocrine disrupting chemicals? No. It could be due to uh, things like increased um, you know, nutrition. It could be due to increased fats. Where, you know, there, was a, uh, there was a report published recently saying that 25% of our three-year-olds are now obese. So it could be to do with the fat and we're retaining these chemicals. And also, it could be due to the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Right. Humans are very multifactorial. There's lots of different uh, reasons. Like, like, there are 74 million chemicals out there. Your average person gets exposed to 70 to 100,000 chemicals every single day. The milk that you had this morning would have had lots of lipophilic compounds in it. Yeah, the cereal you would have had would have had chemicals in it. So we live in a, in a sea, so to actually say it's due to one thing and not the other is very, very difficult. Right. All I can say is downstream of a sewage treatment plant uh, that isn't working correctly that I have found delayed sperm production in trout and I have found intersex in fish. While a direct link between human health and endocrine disrupting chemicals isn't fully understood, research shows that endocrine related diseases and disorders are on the rise. Neural behavioral disorders have increased and a range of related cancers such as breast, prostate and thyroid are all on the rise internationally and here in Ireland. Can they be collected in the sewage system or, or is there anything that can be done at that stage? Yeah, modern sewage treatment plants, okay, they're not actually designed to remove these chemicals, okay. They are designed to remove the, um, the bacteria from the uh, sewage. They're designed to actually remove uh, deoxygenation potential. Things like BOD, they're designed to remove nitrates and phosphates, but not these chemicals. Modern living has exposed us to a massive number of chemical environmental pollutants in our diet and in the environment. The complexity of how they affect human health isn't fully understood, but we know that many health problems today are hugely influenced by environmental pollution. A recent study from the New England Journal of Medicine suggested for the first time that children born today may not live as long as their parents did because of a combination of environmental, nutritional and social factors. I went to meet Shane Colgan of the EPA to discuss the relationships between environment and health. One of the issues, I suppose, that, that we always talk about when we talk about environment and health was Dublin's smoky coal ban, which was brought in in 1990, and it gets talked about quite a lot across Europe as an example of how environmental regulation can deliver a health benefit. The studies have shown since that have been carried out by, by the, the likes of Professor Luke Clancy have shown that 350 lives are saved every year and continue to be saved every year because of this piece of legislation. So it really does show how, how doing something to protect the environment brings about a real, I suppose, benefit to people's health and saves lives. And what about transport? We do know that there are absolutely health problems associated with, with transport. Car transport is the one that comes to mind. So what sort of impacts from transport are causing the biggest problem to health? I suppose one of the ones that we would be very concerned about would be particulate matter coming out of diesel engines. There's these tiny, tiny little particles that can get inhaled right down into the bottom of your lungs. And it's something that in Ireland and across Europe people are concerned about and trying to work towards seeing if this is a regulation or a, or a technology solution or a little bit of both that, that we can put in place to protect health in that way. What we need to do is develop regulation that will control how people move around the place, um, but also we need to have alternatives in place, so public transport working well and maybe electric vehicles when they start to come in, things like this. So it'll be a little bit of a twin track approach to sort of regulating for our health and also having the alternatives so we can live our lives as well. But certainly, yeah, it's not possible to, to regulate everything. As I say, the EPA has a role in encouraging people to move in the right direction, but th this is a difficult one. It's clear that regulating for every one of the thousands of pollutants we're exposed to would be difficult. 
But there's new signs showing some very alarming things about other chemicals and especially strains of bacteria we're creating and we're putting into our water systems and how they're directly affecting human health today. I went to meet expert microbiologist Dr. Martin Cormican in NUI Galway who's been doing cutting edge research into how waste chemicals in the environment are affecting our health. And I know that if I take a sample of water from here right now, that if I take this water back to the laboratory, I can be pretty near certain that I'm going to find E. coli in that water. And there's a very good chance that I'm going to find antibiotic resistant E. coli in that water. And the reason I'm finding E. coli in the water is because there's crap in our water. So it's coming from animals, it's coming from people, it's coming from septic tanks, and it's getting into our water. Martin took me to his lab to show me some of the very concerning problems with some of the chemical pollutants that get poured down drains, flush down toilets, and get into our water systems. Can we be too obsessed with being antiseptic or obsessed with being clean, too clean? Clean is good, but clean is what you can do with soap and water or with detergent and water. You, we don't need to kill all the bacteria on the floor. We can't, and it's foolish to try, because they'll come back in the space of hours in any case. We don't need to kill all the bacteria on our skin, and people are encouraged in this idea. They're encouraged in this idea by people who want to make money by selling them chemicals. Putting chemical disinfectants on your floor or down your toilet, I often say to people, is only a good idea if you plan to eat off it. Martin explained that antibacterial detergents and other pharmaceuticals entering natural water systems are posing a major environmental and health issue, antibiotic resistance. Are we heading for a crisis with this? It's not even that we're heading towards a massive problem. We already have a massive problem. In 1944, original penicillin that Fleming discovered worked great. Now it's useless. We don't even try to use it because we know it won't work. Virtually every Staph aureus associated with people in the world is now resistant to an antibiotic that worked 70 years ago. Into the bottles they pour the liquid medium in which will grow the mold that produces penicillin. To meet the demands of the Allied armies on every Possibly the greatest achievement in medicine in human history was the discovery of penicillin. This wonder drug enabled us to kill bacterial disease for the first time, where we were now able to perform life-saving operations with less risk of infection. Science has won another victory over death. But Martin explained that effective antibiotics may be coming to an end, and we could be heading to a world of no working antibiotics that can treat these rapidly emerging strains of bacteria. So why is it difficult now to find new antibiotics? The key thing about an antibiotic isn't that it kills bacteria, just you need something that kills bacteria and does no harm to the person. That's what you're looking for. Probably the antibiotics that we already have had in the last 70 years, I think, are probably the best ones that there were out there. Um, we need to make them last us for a lot longer and we're doing a very poor job of protecting them for the future at the moment. You can check and you can find uh, traces of antibiotics in the natural environment and most of that antibiotics is coming from the urine and the feces and the waste from people and animals who have been given antibiotics. And the antibiotic doesn't stop working because it's left your body. Antibiotics in the environment come from sources such as livestock and farms and ingested through our bodies or unused medicines and hospitals where wastewater ends up in the natural environment. These antibiotics mix with natural bacteria where they can rapidly evolve into strains of harmful microbes that are resistant to antibiotics. I think what we're doing here is we're fundamentally altering the biodiversity of the bacteria that we share the world with. And I think changing that biodiversity of the bacteria that we share the world with has huge consequences for us. The immediately obvious consequence that everyone can see now is the antibiotic resistance problem. But I think there may be other things going on as well, things that we don't, we don't even properly understand. While exploring this subject of antibiotic resistance, it turned out to be much worse than I ever considered. I went to meet 
Dr. Barry McMahon, Hi, Barry. who's been researching microbial resistance in Ireland's wildlife at UCD. So how prevalent is this in Ireland? Well, almost anywhere we've looked for antibiotic resistance, we've found it. So uh, we've looked for, we've looked at it in herring gulls in Ireland's eye. We've looked for it in lesser blackback gulls on Great Salty off the coast of uh, off the coast of Wexford. Uh, we've looked for it in black-headed gulls in Offaly. We found it. Starlings in uh, around the country, we, we found it, and even the deer in the Wicklow Mountains, we found it. So why is it important that it's in wildlife? I think the fact that antibiotic resistance has managed to get to far-flown places like the Arctic, the Antarctic, or even to Ireland's eye, to the seagull, to the gull colony there, is an indication of how much possible excess usage there is in clinical environments, in hospitals, or in veterinary settings. So that's really the key point: is that it is a symptom of the overusage or abusage of uh, antibiotic compounds. Each year, 100,000 kilograms of antibiotics are used in Irish agriculture. Much of this seeps back into our water systems. On top of this, we prescribe over twice the amount of antibiotics per person than some of our European neighbours. So why are we worse than most of the good countries in Europe? Why are we so bad? It's certainly a serious failure of policy, and I think the responsibility is on a number of areas. Uh, doctors and veterinarians have prescribed too many antibiotics, and we as doctors and veterinarians need to do better about how we prescribe. But we also have to share that responsibility with the wider public and with farmers who have often wanted antibiotics in situations where there were other solutions that didn't require antibiotics, or where the best thing to do was to wait and let nature take its course. Antibiotic resistance is now estimated to be costing Ireland up to 1 billion euros in healthcare services, loss of productivity and other societal costs each year. MRSA and a host of deadly new strains of antibiotic resistant infections, such as drug resistant TB, are now killing 25,000 people a year in Europe. This kills more than AIDS and is fast becoming the global health problem of our time. Scientists sometimes get accused of exaggerating things. This is a global issue and we are seeing levels of um, antibiotic resistance around the world which are absolutely frightening in terms of the fact that drugs and different treatments that were used for a, a range of different bacteria in the last 10 or 20 years are now ceasing to work. How do we deal with this problem? Well, the way that we deal with it is about getting better at, uh, first of all, the managing septic tanks, and there's some change coming on that now, which is very welcome, but it's long overdue. But also there are rules that are in place about land spreading of animal waste and making sure that those rules are complied with will help to protect the sources. So what we need to do is make sure that we have buffer zones around our rivers and catchment areas to make sure that um, faecal material is not getting in to the water. There are some simple things we can do to reduce the problem. Unused medicines should always be returned to the pharmacy and never flush down toilets or discarded into waste bins. We also need to stop them from escaping into our natural water systems, both from agricultural sources and from wastewater treatment plants. When pharmaceuticals do get into our water systems, our wastewater treatment plants are not designed to remove many of the new harmful chemicals and microbes that we're now finding to be posing an ominous health crisis. Perhaps one way to reduce pollutants from getting into our environment is by engineering the physical properties of nature and to use them as a barrier. Integrated constructed wetlands have proved to be a very cost-effective way of treating wastewater. By channeling wastewater through a series of carefully engineered wetland ponds, the natural system breaks down the harmful substances through a combination of biological filtration mechanisms. How does this actually work? What's the simple kind of method? The wetland intercepts the polluted water and supports a microcosm of bacteria which cleans the water. 
Can we do anything about the cryptosporidium and E. coli that has infected so much of our drinking water? The uh, nature of integrated constructive wetlands is such that they are very capable of removing most of these pathogens, if not all. And we have already seen through a, a couple of uh, short studies the, the huge reduction in the contamination and almost elimination indeed for some of these. Considering the very low cost of integrated constructed wetlands compared to mechanical wastewater treatment systems, we should at least be taking them much more seriously as a solution to a range of water pollutions. But we need more research and evidence to prove that these systems can take all pharmaceuticals, antibiotic-resistant microbes and endocrine disruptors out of our water systems. Today, almost all our wastewater flows through mechanical treatment plants that are not designed to remove these chemicals and spent medicines. But Dr. Mary Garvey in Athlone IT has come up with a revolutionary technological solution to removing endocrine disruptors, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, and other harmful substances in water. Mary found that pulsing blasts of super high intensity ultraviolet light breaks down all known harmful chemicals and bacteria. Right, so really it's light, high intensity high ultraviolet intensity light. light yeah. And how does that kill them? For the endocrine chemicals, it breaks the bonds that hold the structures together. For the parasites, it um, interrupts the parasite DNA, so it means that they can't reproduce. The benefits of the system that we have is that it has more than one wavelength, so it interrupts the DNA, it damages proteins and enzymes and a whole load of other essential cell components. Right, and does this go into the wastewater system are procured uh, or into the drinking water size? This can be used, uh, the system that we have at the moment, we're looking at using it for both drinking water and wastewater. Okay, so if we take a situation of a wastewater treatment plant, yeah. can you add this on to the kind of end of pipe solution to it before the water discharges into a river? Yes, that's the idea, yeah. You add it on at the end of the uh, plant and then before the water is released into the environment, it gets treated with this UV light and with the idea of breaking down the chemicals or inactivating the parasites. And is this all new technology? The system we have is very novel at the moment, yeah. Right. It's great to see these cutting edge technologies being developed in Ireland, but they're yet to be mainstreamed and the economic costs are still unknown. Modern living is exposing us to a multitude of environmental toxins. New science is only starting to understand how some of these pollutants are affecting human health. It's an ongoing challenge for state environmental and health authorities to keep up with new hazardous substances and their risks. So from my point of view, I think it's important to remember that we have to protect people's health so that it's safe, so we remove pollutants, we regulate, we do all of those things. But the other side of it is just recognising, getting out, valuing the, the, what's around us in nature, as I say, getting the air into your lungs, just getting out, stretching the legs. That's important too for your health. And it's lovely to be out here today. Fantastic. The benefits from exercising, filling your lungs with clean air, these are huge. And they're well documented through various studies which have shown that, you know, there's a health benefit from this thing. And the HFC have started doing some interesting work now up in Donegal on what they call a green prescription, which combines traditional treatment with nature, if you want to call it that, as a treatment for people who are dealing with stress. Obesity is an issue that's going to come big in Ireland. And if we can organise our environment and our nature so that you can access it easily, maybe you can drive there, you can park and then get out and enjoy something clean. The environment is here for us and the environment is a powerful thing to, to, to aid our health, our good health. It's clear that the natural environment has a strong relationship with our own health. Man-made environmental toxins are doing massive damage to our natural environment and ecosystems. We're now only starting to understand how this damage is affecting our own health and well-being. So we have to continue to ask ourselves, as a society, what level of harm we're willing to accept.